A reading from the beginning of the letter of St. Paul to Titus. Paul, a slave of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's chosen ones and the recognition of religious truth and the hope of eternal life that God, who does not lie, promised before time began, who indeed at the proper time revealed his word and the proclamation with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, so that you might set right what remains to be done and appoint presbyters in every town as I directed you. Verbum Domini. Proclaim God's marvelous deeds to all the nations. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all you lands. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Announce his salvation day after day. Tell his glory among the nations, among all peoples, his wondrous deeds. Give to the Lord, you families of nations, give to the Lord glory and praise. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. He has made the world firm not to be moved. He governs the peoples with equity. The Lord Jesus appointed 72 other disciples, whom he sent ahead of him in pairs, to every town and place he intended to visit. He said to them, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. And to whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you, for the laborer deserves his pay. 
Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God is at hand for you. Verbum Domini. Nos Today we celebrate the memorial of Saints Timothy and Titus, co-workers of Paul, and they have their own respective letters in the New Testament. <clears throat> And they are part of these laborers in the vineyard that are handing on what was given to them, what was revealed to them, and Jesus Christ. And they labored hard, they struggled. And the Lord tells us today to, to pray. There's this mysterious connection between prayer, prayer, praying and the holiness of the people of God and the rising up of ministers you know, for his gospel commanded to pray and, and to foster vocations. And certainly, I think uh, a strong family life uh, will help you know, to answer, to help young men uh, to answer that call, you know, to be priests, to be bishops, and to, to hand on this saving truth that uh, God has left us in Jesus Christ. So Paul says in his letter today, we read to Titus, he says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's chosen ones and the recognition of religious truth and the hope of eternal life. Paul has these wonderful introductions to his letter where he says so much, he's an apostle, he's one sent, you know, to hand on the saving truth. For the sake of the faith of God's chosen ones. That's the purpose, right, of the priesthood is to minister to the people of God, to build up that people of God and the recognition of religious truth that leads us, that gives us a hope for eternal life. If we believe in this saving truth, and if we believe in Jesus Christ, what he gave us, what he taught us, we have this hope of eternal life. The revelation of God's word is, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that saving truth necessary for our salvation is revealed to us in Christ. And it has an objective content. There's something uh, new, radically new in Jesus Christ, necessary for our salvation that has been revealed to us. That God has revealed himself, his very self, who he is, and his saving plan, his saving will for us, so that we can enter into a relationship with him of truth and love. And Jesus is the mediator and the fullness of this revelation. He's the mediator of the new covenant. We can look at creation, the natural world. We can see its beauty uh, and its order, its majesty. And this reveals something of the creator. God is revealed and known through his works, most definitely. And hopefully we've all experienced that. You know, just take a First, turn off the iPods, the cell phones, the television, get outside, you know, and take a walk and observe something. And this can give us peace. It can nurture us. So often today, as we all experience, our media can just kind of tear us apart. It's about stimulating us. And it gets harsher and more intrusive and more exciting in one sense, we could say. And oftentimes it doesn't, leads, doesn't lead us to peace, doesn't leave us with a peace. Creation is like God speaking to us, nurtures us, and invites us to come to know him in a deeper way. We were in, uh, Brother John and I went to San Francisco for the Walk for Life to help with the coverage. And we always uh, have some extra time and it's just a beautiful area, you know, to go up that coast and to see the, you know, you go up those cliffs. I think some of them are like a thousand feet above sea level. You can see just that Pacific Ocean, the waves, the big redwood trees. It's a, 
I think some of the most beautiful part of the country. And it just, it, it, get, it leads you into a silent, contemplative stance. And it's something so peaceful. And we can do that anywhere. You know, all of creation shouts to us the glory of God. It's there to lead us to God. And it's, it manifests his glory to some degree. And we long for this peace. We long for the light of truth. We long for salvation. We long for this communion with God. We know something's wrong with the world. Something's wrong with our very selves. We need help. We need God. You know, through reason, we can know that God exists. But sin, our personal sin, the fallenness of the world, blindness gets in there. Error gets in there. And we need God's revelation. We need his explicit revelation. We need his help. And that comes to us in his word, the second person of the Trinity, that he reveals himself in, all its full, in his fullness and his plan for our salvation. That he's created the world through his word and he renews the world and renews us through his, world, through his word. So beginning with the patriarchs, the prophets, you know, the revelation of the Old Testament, and culminating in the gospel, he has given us a truth. He's given us a saving truth, that Jesus is the fullness, the fulfillment of all that revelation of the Old Testament. He is the source of all saving truth and moral teaching. And the second person, the word, comes to us through scripture and tradition that the apostles you know, and their co-workers handed on what they received from Christ, from what he taught them, his way of life and his works, or through promptings of the Holy Spirit. We refer to that as tradition. You know, all the books St. John tells us cannot contain everything that Jesus said and did. So Jesus tells us, you know, there's, there's more he wants to tell us, but we can't bear it now. So we need that gift of the Holy Spirit, not to give us something new. We say revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. They were a special chosen few to hand on what they received. And, and that has come to us in scripture and tradition. So that prompting of the Holy Spirit is not giving us something new but it's giving us a growth of insight into the reality and words given to them, making explicit what is implicit there. So, you know, guided by the magisterium, we can unpack that revelation that was given to us, you know, by the lives of the saints, a witness to this saving truth, how they lived, what they did in their lives. We can come to know the fullness of revelation. And so it becomes more clear as the church proclaims dogmas and her teachings guided by the Holy Spirit, what this saving truth, this revelation that comes to us in Jesus Christ is. So the apostles, their successors handed on through oral preaching by their example, by their oral preaching, by their example, and by the ordinances they laid down. And through, in a sense, we could say tradition precedes scripture, that scripture comes to us and we can more thoroughly understand it through tradition, that it, in a sense, contains the divine, but we say that scripture, in a, in a singular way, contains that divine word. But we understand that scripture in a deeper way through tradition. So that's the two-font source of the word that comes to us. And we need that saving truth. It's a, your truth is a precious commodity today. Our news cycle is on steroids today. It's rabid. You know, it's, it's like, I mean, it seems like you turn on the news, it's two pundits duking it out, fighting. You know, it's a bloodbath. You know, one expert says one thing and another expert, you know, quote unquote expert, says something else. And our media whips us up into a frenzy. You know, it's become an entertainment and not a source of truth. And we get so disturbed and whipped up that we 
we have meltdowns and we have, you know, the cameras on our phones capture these videos of people just having meltdowns, you know, in public in weird places. <laughs> we need a bearer of truth to guide us because left to our own devices, we fall into error. So Paul and his co-workers were sent to hand on a precious saving truth which we need for the fullness of life. And this order of revelation, as I said, comes to us in the church. The church possesses this scripture and tradition, and it's distinct from the order of creation, you know, where we have science and politics. You know, they has, in a certain sense, its own laws and properties, its own autonomy that's discovered and developed uh, through reason. Certainly, the truths of our faith and moral truth is there to guide us, gives us principles uh, to develop the science of politics, we could say. But the created order does have its own autonomy. But we as Christians are guided by the truth of Jesus Christ. We're rooted in that. We have a hope and a peace that's found in him that we can go and develop the created order, the created world. We have such a vital mission today. And as we have the pro-life marches this week, you know, across the country, I think it is so clear. Because as our culture has you know, and our laws have gotten it wrong on this issue, it's gotten it wrong on aspects of marriage. We need Christian witness to bear a witness to the truth of the human person, of moral truth. You know, I was coming back uh, from the walk for life and in the airport and usually we engage people and talk to people and uh, one woman challenged me on the issue, you know, the church is teaching on abortion and life. And she looked me dead in the eye and said, it's just uh, it's a, malignant, a malignant tumor. You know, the baby in the womb is a malignant tumor. She told me that twice. She was pretty confrontational. And I thought to myself, you don't even really believe that. You know, does something magically happen when the child is given, you know, when, was given birth to that changes from a tumor to a human being. You know, the church's teaching is that the child in the womb has its own DNA, has its own growth in life, has its own blood type, is distinct from the mother. It's its own organism. Nothing magic happens as it passes through the birth canal. It's a child before it's born. And we as Christians, you know, that truth is, we know, can know that by reason, by science. It's confirmed by our church and its moral teaching. So we have a, a duty to go out and bear witness, to give testimony to the dignity of that life. We don't just say, well, it's my truth, and I'm not going to have an abortion, but, you know, you do it if that's, if that's what you believe. No, we fight for justice. This is an atrocity that is happening, uh, you know, by the tens of millions every year in the world, throughout the world. This is a, a huge, you know, a huge travesty. This is a huge abomination. It's not just isolated, uh, you know, occurrences. You know, some say it's the leading cause of death in the world. The statistics are hard to know, but it is rampant, rampant in, in the culture, and we need to oppose this and fight this. And certainly the marches can bring an awakening and awareness of consciences that we can proclaim this dignity. And of course it takes more than that. It takes our efforts outside of marches, and we need to work to promote the dignity of life, you know, at all levels. So may we be faithful to this call. May we be faithful in proclaiming this truth to a world that has often fallen into such darkness. Christians very much need to be on the front lines today proclaiming the truth.